Abraham and God talk about Sodom and Gomorrah. Before this story, we learned about how God made a covenant with Abram and renamed him Abraham. He renamed Sarai to Sarah and promised them a son despite their old age. Even in doubt, insecurity, and disobedience, God continues to make promises to Abraham's family. Now we revisit the evil cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, as God is about to judge those within the city, and Abraham intervenes, inspired by the book of Genesis. Hello, I'm Jack Graham with today's episode of the Bible in a Year podcast. When we last saw Abraham and Sarah, They were receiving their new names and a renewed affirmation of God's covenant to make a great nation through them. In today's reading, we'll find God paying a special visit to Abraham, and when he comes, he is not alone. Abraham bows before the Lord and welcomes the travelers with hospitality, sparing no good thing as he lavishes them with fresh food and drink. The first thing that God does is once again reassure Abraham and Sarah of his promise to give them a child. But that's not all he is there for. There is a grave matter to which God must attend, the rampant wickedness of two cities. We've heard their names before, Sodom and Gomorrah. But now God's patience with the evil doing has run out. As we've seen before, evil cannot and will not go unpunished. Justice will be served, must be served. As you listen today, pay attention first to God's patient love towards Sarah, who is still very dubious of her prospects for motherhood. Notice how God does not become angry at her doubt, but instead reassures her as a loving parent does to a child. Then, as you hear the Lord and Abraham discuss Sodom and Gomorrah and God's plan to mete out his righteous justice on the great sin he is seeing, Watch how Abraham intervenes. This is a great lesson in both humility and boldness before the Lord to be learned here in this passage. So let's listen in as God and Abraham talk about Sodom and Gomorrah. Under the shade of the trees in Mamre, in the heat of the day, the Lord appeared near Abraham's tent. Only this time, he did not come as he usually did. Abraham was visited by three strangers, seemingly divine in nature, and one among them spoke as the Lord. Abraham bowed to them, knowing that this was not a usual thing. He lavished them with a meal and worshipped God with his hospitality underneath the trees. After the men had their fill and were rested, one of them asked, Where is your wife Sarah? Sarah was close by in the tent beside the trees, listening to their conversation and trying not to be heard. She is in the tent, Abraham responded, not sure how to speak with these strangers. The Lord once again spoke his promise to Abraham, knowing Sarah was listening through the tent. When I return to you about this time next year, your wife shall have a son. A faint laugh could be heard from the tent. Sarah, an old woman far past her childbearing years, could not fathom such a notion. The idea of two people nearly a hundred years old even having normal sex was a laughable idea. After I am worn out and my husband is old, shall I even have pleasure? Sarah chuckled to herself. God, hearing this, turned to Abraham and asked, Why does Sarah doubt that she can have a child at her age? Let me ask you this. Is anything impossible for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the creator of the stars and the mender of all things broken? Listen again. About this time next year I will return to you, and Sarah shall have a son. Sarah now found out for her silent chuckling, denied ever having laughed or doubted. With a kind grin, as a loving father looks at his child who was caught sneaking around, said, Yes, you did. And then the three strangers began their descent towards Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham walked with them to send them on their way. 
The three were speaking among themselves, and the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Abraham will become a great and mighty nation, established by me. I have chosen him to lead the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. So God turned to Abraham honestly and spoke plainly. The prayers and the outcries of those suffering because of Sodom and Gomorrah have become great. They are a people corrupted and poisoned by selfishness, and their sins are grave. I am going down to observe them and measure them according to their deeds. If they are truly as sinful as reported, I will know. As the Lord and Abraham were talking, the two other strangers began their descent into Sodom. Whether Abraham was aware of it or not, a compassionate and curious heart came upon him. He inquired to the Lord, asking, Will you wipe out the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are fifty righteous people in the city. Will you then destroy the place and not spare it for the fifty righteous who are in it? It does not sound like you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked. Far be that from you. You are the judge of all the earth. Should you not do what is just? This was a bold inquiry coming from Abraham as he was speaking face to face with he who causes the seas to rise and fall with the moon, and cradles the heavens in the span of his hands. The Lord, however, spoke plainly and compassionately with Abraham, saying, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous in the city, I will spare everything for their sake. Abraham had more questions. He was unsatisfied with his question before. Now, coming to realize who he was speaking to, Abraham approached the subject again. Only this time with more reverence, he asked, I know who I am speaking to, and I am but dust and ashes in front of you, and not worthy. But suppose there are forty-five righteous in the city. Will you destroy the whole city if there are five less righteous than before? The Lord looked again at Abraham and answered, I will not destroy it if I find forty-five righteous. What about forty righteous? Suppose there are only forty. Will you destroy the city then? I will not. Please do not get angry with me, Abraham said. But what if there were only thirty righteous people in the city? I will not do it if I find thirty there. God replied, Twenty? For the sake of those twenty, I will not destroy the city. Please, Lord, I know that I am dust before you. Do not be angry with me, and let me ask this last question. What if there were only ten righteous among the city? Would you spare the city if there were ten righteous? The Lord looked again finally at Abraham. His chosen hero was speaking before him with boldness and humility. The man he had chosen to be father of nations was now displaying a heart to see the righteous upheld and the innocent spared. He answered Abraham tenderly, and one final time he said, For the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way toward Sodom, and Abraham returned to his home. Our passage today opens with a visit by God to Abraham and Sarah's tent. But this was a different kind of visit, and we see God is joined by two others who are heavenly beings, angelic beings. These were angels that would later visit most likely Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham immediately recognizes this as an important visit and rushes to greet the Lord then extends great hospitality, lavishing his guests with bread, milk, curds, and a freshly slaughtered calf. One cannot help but be reminded again of Abel and of his sacrifice of the best of his flock, an offering which the Lord was pleased. What comes next is another reassurance that what God has promised is always true. God will give a son to Abraham, born by his wife Sarah, but now God gives her an actual timeline by this time next year. You see, God doesn't always reveal his timing to us. 
In fact, most often he does not reveal his timeline. But that doesn't mean he can or won't give you an idea of his timing. He knew how much this couple had endured, and this was the final stretch. God wanted them to keep holding fast to the promise because it was just about to happen. The newly renamed couple is continuing to trust and have faith, but this doesn't prevent Sarah from laughing incredulously, unable to yet imagine how this could possibly happen. But notice that God doesn't get upset or offended by this. Instead, he simply asks if there's any doubt that he can truly do what he said. Even after Sarah tries to deny her doubt, the Lord does not grow weary of her or chastise her. All he says is that he knows she laughed, as if to say, I know you did, I know you laughed, but don't worry. The Lord and his travel companions then begin to leave. Headed down south to Sodom and Gomorrah, God has plans for these evil cities. So he shares his plans for justice with Abraham, his chosen man, this man who was to pave the way for God's redemptive plan. The evil and the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah can no longer be tolerated. God is going to wipe out those two towns. These are the cities where his nephew Lot, Abraham's nephew Lot, lives with his family. But otherwise, They're of no great consequence to Abraham. That's why what happens next is so amazing. Abraham intervenes. He intervenes by asking God to allow for an opportunity for these cities to be spared. He asks God to find just 50 righteous men in Sodom, and if he does, to relent from destroying them. Throughout his life, Abraham has seen that God's plan will not be stopped. And yet here he is boldly asking God to change his mind. God agrees, but Abraham wants more. Fifty might be too many. He has, after all, been living in the area and knows of the wickedness of the people of these cities. So he suggests a lower number. What I love about Abraham's second request is the humility with which he approaches God, even as he is being so incredibly bold. Genesis 18, 27 to 28 records this conversation. And Abraham replied, Now behold, I have ventured to speak to the Lord, although I am but dust and ashes. Suppose the 50 righteous men are lacking five. Will you destroy the whole city because of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. Now, here is a wonderful lesson on boldness and humility at the same time. Abraham has asked God for a huge thing, and God has agreed, but he wants to take it a step further. Notice how he handles this. First, acknowledging his position relative to God, I'm but dust and ashes, and that's who we are compared to the greatness and the glory of God. We are dust and ashes, and then boldly and clearly making his request. This is how we are to approach God in prayer. First, recognizing God's immense greatness and power and glory and our smallness by comparison. But then we can make our request with confidence, confidence because we know in Jesus Christ, God has promised to hear us. Here, God once again agrees with the proposition, and this goes on several more times until Abraham is able to whittle the number down to just 10 righteous men, just 10. The Lord then turns and heads to Sodom in search of a few righteous men who can spare this wicked city. We'll find out the next time what happened. Lord God, thank you for this passage and how we can learn so much. Thank you for your loving patience with us and for the times when you reveal your great plans in detail to us, as you did with Abraham and Sarah. We know you do not have to do this but you choose to do it for our sake. Thank you, Lord, that we can approach you with boldness and humility, that we can ask for our heart's desire. Help us to trust you more, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to today's Bible in a Year podcast. I'm Pastor Jack Graham from Dallas, Texas. Download the Pray.com app and make prayer a priority in your life. If you enjoyed this podcast, Share it with someone you know, someone you love, because by sharing this podcast, you can make a big difference in someone's life in Jesus' name. And if you want more resources on how to tap into God's life, God's power, God's strength for successful Christian living, 
Be sure to visit jackgraham.org. God bless you.